These days, just about everybody is connected in some way to the Internet. In this lesson, we're going to talk about the different ways that you can connect to the Internet from your home or from a small office. The first connectivity method we're going to talk about is PSTN, or the Public Switched Telephone Network. Now, PSTN sounds really complex, but what we're really talking about here is a modem. You've probably done this at some point, where you connect to the Internet by dialing up through a modem installed in your computer. Now, with a modem, we take a binary PC signal, and we convert it into an analog signal that can be transmitted through the telephone network. As far as the telephone network is concerned, that signal is a phone call. It doesn't know that it's actually a modem that's communicating binary data. The other end, we have another modem that converts the analog data back into binary PC data. Now, the modem takes your phone line and uses it, the entire phone line, as 164 kilobit per second data channel. Now, you probably know that if you use the modem, you really can't get 64 kilobits per second transfer rate. Instead, due to limitations with the phone line, the maximum theoretical you can really get is 56 kilobits per second. And in many areas, because of the quality of the phone line, you're really looking more like 33.6 kilobits per second. So how do you hook it all up? Well, you have your PC, and you either have a modem that's installed or inside in an expansion slot, or you have an external modem out here that's connected to the PC with a serial cable. On the back of the modem is an RJ11 jack, which is simply a telephone jack that plugs into a wall outlet at your house or at your small office. It's also an RJ11 jack. And in essence, it becomes a telephone device on the public switch telephone network. Now, in addition to the slow speeds, one of the problems with using a modem on the public telephone network is what I said earlier, and that's the fact that it takes the entire channel. There's no multiplexing. What does that mean? That means if you're on the Internet, nobody else can use the phone. Conversely, if somebody's using the phone, you can't use the phone with a modem to connect to the Internet. You probably already know that from your experience using modems in the past. Modems were great. We used them for many years. However, we kind of hit that 56K barrier, and frankly, folks wanted more speed. The telephone companies have come up with newer standards that allow us to get a lot more speed over those same uh, telephone wires. One we're going to talk about first here is the digital subscriber line, or DSL. Now, DSL uses digital signals over your regular telephone wires. It allows you to use the telephone and the Internet at the same time. And that's because DSL uses a form of multiplexing. Now, what does multiplexing mean? It means we can take our phone channel here. By the way, multiplexing is also called broadband. We take that phone channel and we divide it up into chunks. We have actually several channels now, and we can use part of it for phone. We can use the other parts for our DSL. What benefit is that to you? That means that you can be on the phone and using your internet connection at exactly the same time. Now there are many different kinds of DSL implementations. They all have, they use different protocols and they provide different speeds. Now the protocols used with DSL are specific electrical implementations. For instance, sometimes you'll hear of ADSL. Well, ADSL is a specific implementation of the DSL uh, method. So a lot of times when we're talking about DSL generically, you'll hear it referred to simply as XDSL. That encompasses all the different uh, speeds and protocols that are used to provide a DSL connection. How do you hook up a DSL connection? Let's take a look. The first thing you have to do is call your telephone company and have them turn DSL on. And that can be a problem for a lot of folks because you have to live close enough to your local loop in order to have DSL capabilities. If you're too far away, you can't get DSL. Once you get it turned on, you need to implement a DSL router.
Now there's a misnomer in the industry. Well, you'll hear this referred to as a DSL modem. That's not correct because a modem, remember, takes a digital signal and converts it to an analog signal. DSL is digital all the way. So what we have is a DSL router and it plugs into your wall jack of your telephone using an RJ11 connector. Now if you have other telephones hooked in here, you might have a second wall jack here that connects to your, your telephone. As it's multiplexed, you can use both at the same time. However, with some DSL implementations, there's a little bit of noise because we're breaking up that channel. Sometimes there's a little bit of bleed over from the DSL channels into the phone channel and you might get a little bit of noise. In that case, they might install a filter over here on the line that's connected to the phone to filter out the junk that might be leaking over from the DSL connection. A lot of times there's a port on the back of the DSL router as well that allow you to plug the phone in. Then, on the back of the DSL router, more than likely, it has several RJ45 jacks, Ethernet jacks. Then you can take your computer systems down here, install an Ethernet card, plug it in there, and you've got internet connectivity. The nice thing about it is you can hook up multiple workstations all at the same time and share the big bandwidth that's provided by the DSL connection. Now, usually, as well, this DSL router will have a built-in DHCP server so you can configure your workstations to use TCP IP. Now there's another uh, internet connectivity option that's very similar to DSL. And that's the Integrated Services Digital Network or ISDN. Now like DSL, ISDN takes your phone line and divides it into multiple channels. However, there's different levels of service with ISDN. With ISDN, the basic one is called the Basic Rate Interface or BRI. With BRI, we take our phone line, just like with DSL, and we divide it up into channels. We have our phone up here, just like with DSL, so we can still make telephone calls. Then we take the rest of the bandwidth and we use it for digital communications. Now with BRI, we have three channels. We have two 64 kilobit per second channels. These are used for data, and then we have one 16 kilobit per second channel that's used for connection control. If you were going to install a connection at home or your home office, more than likely you would use the BRI interface. Now there's a second interface called the primary rate interface. Just like with BRI, we take the phone line and we divide it up into channels. However, PRI provides a lot more data channels and actually more than your regular phone line can handle. So you actually have to have special wiring installed to give you all the channels. With PRI, we have up to 23 64 kilobit per second data channels, and you have one 64 kilobit per second control channel. Now, in the United States, ISDN isn't that widely implemented. Anywhere you go in the United States where you can get ISDN, you can also get DSL, which frankly provides a lot more bandwidth. Um, however, in Europe, ISDN is very popular. So if you're working with Europeans, more than likely you're going to be dealing with, a, with an ISDN connection. Now, there's another type of internet connectivity that's very popular in the United States as well, and that's through your cable TV company. They take that coaxial cable that's coming into your house that provides a uh, cable TV service, and they also provide a data channel on it to provide you with internet connectivity. Now, the advantage of this is that usually the wiring is already there. There's nothing special you have to do. In addition, that cable TV wire is already multiplexed. That's how come you have a hundred and some odd channels coming in on that one cable. It's not, it doesn't take a whole lot more to add a couple more channels and use it for data as well. Now, the way it works is that we have to use a cable modem. Now, unlike a DSL line or an ISDN line where we're talking about a digital signal. We're dealing with a cable signal. We're dealing with analog. A multiplexed analog signal. We have all of our regular cable TV channels. Then we also have data channel. In order to make this work, we have to install a cable modem. It truly is a modem because it converts the analog signal coming from the cable 
into a digital signal. So usually we have a modem installed either in the PC or as a standalone router, kind of like a DSL router. And we have our cable TV connector in the wall. We connect the cable modem to the cable connection in the wall. And more than likely, you're going to have a series of Ethernet ports here. Install an Ethernet card in your PC, connect to it through here. There are some implementations where it doesn't provide the ports. Instead, it's just a USB interface that connects to a USB port on your PC. Depending on your cable TV provider, the type you get will vary. Now, for the most part, in the United States, you're going to be dealing with a modem, you're going to be dealing with DSL, or you're going to be dealing with cable modems. However, there are two more options that we need to talk about. One of them is satellite. Now, the satellite internet connection uses uh, a satellite dish, just like satellite TV, to connect to the internet. And it's really great if you're in a remote location that you don't have any other options for connecting to the internet. You could even put it on the top of, a, of an RV or a mobile home, and you can have mobile internet access. Now, the hard part is that you've got to make sure that your, your satellite dish is pointed right at that satellite to get that connectivity. And you're also subject to some at atmospheric interference. You know, if you have satellite TV, you know that if it snows a lot and snow gets on your dish, you don't have a picture. Same with the internet connection. Now, there's different types of satellite uh, internet connection implementations. A lot of them are somewhat, well, disappointing for lack of a better word, because they'll use the dish for downloading information. However, for uploading, you still have to use a 56K modem. In other words, when you type HTTP colon slash slash and then your URL, that request, that send request, goes through the modem. The return request comes down through the satellite dish. So it's got its pluses and its minuses. It really is a fast connection, though. It's like DSL. You can get some really, really fast Internet connections. You just have to remember that usually the download side that's fast. The upload side is really slow. The last thing we want to talk about is wireless Internet connections. This is kind of a misnomer because a, there's no really such thing as a true wireless connection to the Internet. Somewhere along the line, you've got a wireless connection between the PC and some other device that is connected to the Internet, probably with a wire. Now, wireless uh, uh, Internet connections are typically very short range. It means that you have to have a wireless hub somewhere within about 100 yards or so at the most. Now, there are some communities in the United States that are setting up uh, shared wireless hubs in neighborhoods so that everybody in the neighborhood can use that internet connection. It's kind of a growing thing. It'll be interesting to see if it really takes off. More commonly, you're going to find a wireless internet connection in an airport or a hotel. Basically, in that, those situations, you're just connecting to a wireless network, which is then connected to the internet using either DSL or T1.